hang up and try again. I'm Pastor John Baird, and I want to welcome you to The Way the Word Ministries television ministry. I'm honored to be here with each and every one of you, as always, sharing God's Word. And you and I, we're still in our series, The Miracles and Parables of Jesus. This is message number 27 in the series, and the title of today's message is Seven About Heaven. And we'll be in the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 23 through 33. And that, heaven, is exactly what you and I are going to be talking about today. Now, everyone has heard those stereotypical jokes about Peter meeting people at the gates of heaven. Now, usually in those jokes, the Apostle Peter is referred to as Saint Peter, and the gates of heaven are called either the pearly gates or the golden gates. And the whole idea in the jokes is that somebody dies and goes to heaven, and Saint Peter decides whether or not they're going to get into heaven. The whole concept is totally unbiblical. Nevertheless, there was a man, and this man died, and he went to heaven. And St. Peter met him there and said, tell me why I should let you into heaven. And the man said, well, when I was down on earth, I did a lot of things to try and help other people. And uh, St. Peter, he said, can you give me an example? And the guy said, well, uh, one time I was in this diner and this street gang came in and they started scaring everybody and pushing everybody around. And finally, they started picking on this little old lady. Well, I got up out of my seat and I walked over to the leader of the gang and I put my hand on his shoulder and I spun him around and I looked him in the eye and I said, hey, why don't you pick on somebody your own size? And uh, St. Peter, he said, wow, that was really brave. When did that happen? And the guy said, oh, about three minutes ago. <whistles> so there are a whole lot of jokes floating around out there about a heaven, but the vast majority of them are extremely misleading. They're not based on any sort of biblical truth. Again, the Bible never says that the Apostle Peter is going to be meeting anyone at the gates of heaven to admit them into heaven. You know why? Because Peter can't get you into heaven. Only Jesus can get you into heaven, and that is no joke. Now, in the Bible, Jesus, he had a lot to say about heaven. As a matter of fact, in our verses today, he's going to reveal some information about heaven to a group of people who didn't even believe there was such a place as heaven. Check it out. Matthew chapter 22, verses 23 through 33. That same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and have children for him. Now, there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and third brother right on down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven since all of them were married to her? Jesus replied, You are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. The Sadducees were a small but influential group there in Jerusalem. They were much more liberal 
than the Pharisees. They were sort of the aristocrats of Judaism. They were much like the liberal Hollywood sports and political elitists in our nation today. Now, the Sadducees, they didn't believe in miracles or the resurrection or any kind of afterlife. That must be how they got their name, Sadducees. They didn't have faith, so they were sad, you see. Now, if you go to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 25, you'll find what's called the law of the Leverite marriage. And that law there said that if a man died without leaving a son, his next older brother inherited all of his property, including his wife. Wow, that wouldn't go nowadays, would it? Check it out with me, though, here in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 and 6. It says, if brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. Now that whole thing doesn't make a lot of sense to you and I here in our day because we're going to figure that if they were brothers and they had sons, all of them are going to have the same last name. But names didn't work the same way back then as they do now. And that's another message for another time. Now, those verses, they go on to say that if the living brother, if he refused to marry his dead brother's widow, she could meet him in public, spit in his face, take his sandals, and that would make him publicly Shamed. I guess that's how they shamed people and slandered people's names before social media. I don't know. But most brothers, they obliged and they did marry their dead brother's widow. And then if she would have a son, that son, he would claim all of his father's property and he would carry on his father's name. The whole thing really doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, but the Sadducees, they really took the Leverite marriage law and extrapolated it to a worst case scenario. Seven brothers marrying the same woman and each of them dying. Now, this, of course, is a fabricated example, and it was fabricated by the Sadducees. If something like that really happened, I imagine husband number four wouldn't have been too happy about marrying this widow, but I imagine husbands number five, six, and seven would have been thinking something like, hey man, what's she putting in her meatloaf? And in our verses, when the Sadducee that was speaking got done with his ridiculous case study, I imagine he looked around at all the other Sadducees with a grin on his face, thinking he had Jesus right where he wanted him, and that's when he decided to mockingly ask his preposterous a question. Now, remember, our verses told us that these guys, the Sadducees, they didn't even believe in the resurrection. And so he looks at Jesus and he says, OK, Jesus, so exactly whose wife is she going to be at the resurrection? <laughs> and so it was a preposterous question. But here in our day, believe it or not, I've had people, people who've been married more than once, who don't study the Bible, they've come up to me and sincerely asked a similar question. These are people who've been married more than once due to death or divorce, and they come to me and they ask, what will my relationship with my former spouse be like in heaven? And if that is you, you can totally relax because Jesus tells us that there's no such thing as marriage between any of us in heaven. Now, when it comes to heaven, I love to talk about heaven. I love to study about heaven and I love to dream about heaven. I love what the famous preacher Charles Spurgeon used to say to younger preachers when it came to talking about heaven. He would say, when you speak about heaven, let your face light up. But when you speak of hell, well, then your everyday face will do. 
According to statistics, most Americans believe in heaven, but according to those same statistics, only about half of them believe in hell, and yet both of them are real places. And even though those statistics say that most Americans believe in heaven, there's really not a whole lot of excitement about heaven in the United States of America today. And the reason for that is plain and simple. People just don't take the time to study the scriptures and to read about heaven. And believe it or not, the vast majority of people who call themselves Christians, maybe they are Christians, maybe they're not, but the vast majority of them who've come up to me over the years to talk about heaven, they have this idea that eternity in heaven is like some unending church service. They've settled for the vision of the never-ending sing-along in the sky, one great hymn after another, forever and ever and ever. Ever, man, the very thought of that is enough to make your heart sink. At least it does mine. I mean, singing forever, that's it. That's the good news. The truth is, people who say things like that, well, they're illiterate about the Bible. And yet those same people, they have no problem misquoting the scriptures as a source of personal justification to try and make other people feel like they're just a little bit less than them. They want to make other people feel guilty that they're not quite as spiritual as they are. And the problem problem with that is that the people who listen to them, they lose heart and then they turn back to the world. They turn back to the present to try and salvage whatever kind of a life they can salvage. And so as you and I, as we look at heaven today, I want to address seven common questions. And I want to try and answer those questions. And my hope is, is that when we're done with today's message, you'll be more excited about heaven than ever. But you won't just be more excited. You'll be more committed to not only going to heaven, but to taking as many people as you can, as many people as possible with you to heaven. So here we go. Question number one, is heaven for real? I made that the first question because it is the number one question that people ask me. And the answer, the short answer, the only answer is absolutely yes. The word heaven is seen over 600 times in the Bible. And whenever you write the word heaven, Heaven, you should always use a capital H because heaven is a proper noun for a place, just like Cincinnati or Nashville. Back in 2010, there was a pastor by the name of Todd Burpo who wrote a book called Heaven is for Real. You may have read that book or saw the movie that came out in 2014. It's all about how Pastor Todd Burpo's little son, four-year-old son, Colton, had to have emergency surgery, and he had what a lot of people refer to as a near-death experience. However, uh, he recovered, and a few months after his recovery, he and his parents, they were driving by the hospital, and little Colton, he pointed over at the hospital building, and he said, oh, look, that's the building where I saw the angels. And his parents, they smiled at each other, and so they thought they'd have some fun and ask him some questions. And it was a lot of fun. He was answering them in that typical childlike manner. But suddenly, little Colton began to reveal things that he couldn't possibly have known. For instance, he told his mom and dad that he had met his sister, and his mom had miscarried a daughter before little Colton was born, but they had never told little Colton about that. He described meeting his grandfather, who had died 30 years before Colton was even born. And so in both of those cases, he revealed information that he couldn't possibly have known. It's a really good book. If you've never read it, I highly recommend it. And it absolutely lets you know that not only is Jesus for real, but that Jesus loves uh, little children and that uh, Jesus is going to come back very, very 
Soon now, I read the book and I saw the movie, but neither of those made me believe in heaven any more than I already did, because by that time, I had already been reading for, I guess, about 20 years everything that the Bible had to say about heaven. And Jesus has a lot to say about heaven in the Bible. And the reason Jesus knows so much about heaven is because uh, he came from there. Look what he said in the book of John, chapter 6, verse 38. He said, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. I can tell you a whole lot about Cincinnati, Ohio, because I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I was raised in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I've lived most of my life in Cincinnati, Ohio. If you were talking to me and someone who's never been to Cincinnati, Ohio, about Cincinnati, Ohio, well, you're going to get the right information from me. You're going to want to listen to me because I'm going to know more about Cincinnati, Ohio than that other person. That's just common sense. Well, it's the same thing when it comes to heaven. Jesus came from heaven. So we should not only listen to what Jesus has to say about heaven. We should believe everything Jesus has to say about heaven. So question number one, is heaven for real? Jesus says heaven is for real. And he said it not just with his words, but with his actions, his very life. And question number two, Will we know our loved ones in heaven? And again, the answer is absolutely yes. There are many passages in Scripture indicating that we are going to maintain our distinct identity in heaven. At the transfiguration, the three disciples that were present there with Jesus, they recognized Moses and Elijah, whom they had never seen before. The disciples were born thousands of years after Moses and Elijah, and it's not like there would have been statues or drawings of Moses and Elijah around anywhere because those would have been considered graven images in violation of the commandments. And so in response to the Sadducees' foolish question, uh, Jesus refers to Moses' experience at the burning bush where God said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because uh, he was afraid to look at God. In that verse right there, God told Moses, I am, present tense, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so Jesus' logic in referring these Sadducees to that verse is irrefutable. Let me explain it to you in simple terms. My mom died in 2015, but I've got a sister who's still alive. If someone who knew my mom comes up to me on the street and they get introduced to me and they knew my mom, they're going to say, I was, past tense, a friend of your mother's. But if someone gets introduced to me who knows my sister, they're going to say, I am, present tense, a friend of your sister. It's all in the verbs. It's all a matter of the verbs. God was talking to Moses in the present tense, saying that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive. God is saying they're alive and in heaven with me, and they have their distinctive identities that they had on earth. And so contrary to popular folklore, when we die, we don't become angels. Jesus said we become like angels. In the book of Luke, chapter 20, verse 36, Jesus said we become like angels in that we don't die. Check it out. And they can no longer die for they are like the angels. They are God's children since they are children of the resurrection. I've read every passage there is in the Bible about angels and there is never a reference in the Bible anywhere to an angel birth or an angel funeral. Contrary to the Cupid myth, the Bible never refers to any such thing as a baby angel or a senior citizen angel. As a matter of fact, in the book of Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14, we're told that angels are sent here by God to serve people. Check it out. Are not the angels all ministering spirits, servants, sent out in the service of God for the assistance of those who are to inherit salvation? 
And in verse 22 of our verses today, Jesus adds that we will be like angels in heaven. Again, not angels, but like angels in the fact that we won't be married in heaven. We won't marry or be given in marriage in heaven. Jesus says, for when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven. The exact language that Jesus uses here in this verse is really important. It doesn't matter if you're reading it in our modern day English or the oldest known copy in the ancient uh, Greek. Both times Jesus uses a verb when he says at the resurrection, they will neither marry. That's a verb nor be given in marriage. Again, that's a verb. And so we won't be married to each other in heaven, but we will be married to Jesus because the church is the bride of Christ. Look at the book of Revelation chapter 19 verse 7. It says, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. So you'll know your spouse, your ex-spouse or ex-spouses, as well as your family members and friends once you get to heaven. But those relationships aren't going to matter the same way in heaven as they do in the here and now. All of our earthly relationships will be overshadowed in heaven by our relationship with Jesus. And so question number two, will we know our loved ones in heaven? Absolutely we will. And question number three, can people in heaven see us now? In the book of Luke chapter 16, Jesus tells the story about a rich man who died and went to Hades. Hades is a a place of waiting for the unfaithful. Don't get Hades and hell mixed up. Hell is the final destination of the unfaithful. Hades is the place where they wait until the great white throne judgment at the end of Jesus's millennial reign. Anyway, this rich man, he could look across this chasm and he saw a guy he knew from earth named Lazarus. Lazarus was a poor beggar back on earth. And this rich man sees him over there and he's standing over there with Abraham in the place they were standing in was called Abraham's bosom or paradise. This was a place where the faithful uh, were sent until Jesus's great sacrifice of love when the scripture tells us that he set those captives free. He took them in his train, it says, in his following to heaven where I believe Jesus literally poured out his blood at the true mercy seat, the throne of God, and he set those captives free. But back to this true account, this rich man over here in Hades, he looks over and he sees Lazarus and Abraham, and he's also aware of his five brothers back on earth that needed to repent. Uh, Look at this exchange in Luke chapter 16, verses 27 to 28. It says, the rich man called out and said, Father Abraham, please send Lazarus to my home to warn my five brothers so that they will not come to this place. And later in verse 31, Abraham said, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, meaning if they don't believe what the scripture says, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Nonetheless, that guy, even in Hades, he was aware of his five brothers back on earth. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, we're introduced to many people of faith from the Bible who went to heaven. And then in the very first verse of Hebrews, chapter 12, we're told, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. That verse right there, it paints the picture of a stadium and you and I, the faithful over here on this side of heaven, we're down there on the track in that stadium. We're running the race, right? And all those people that love us up in heaven, they're cheering us on. Now, a lot of times when you hear this question asked, when people say, hey, do you think people up in heaven can see us? Other people will answer it real quick. They'll say, I hope not. Or some of them will say, well, Uh, Wouldn't their joy up in heaven be dampened if they had to look back down here at all the sin and all the evil going on on this earth? But I don't believe that those people in heaven see everything that's going on down here on earth. I believe only God 
does that. I mean, these people are cheering us on. They're not crying over you and I. They're encouraging us to run the race with perseverance. And so question number three, can people up in heaven see you and I right now down here on this earth? Absolutely they can. And again, they're encouraging us to run the race, to walk our Christian walks with patience and perseverance and to keep on moving on toward the prize. And question number four, what kind of bodies will we have in heaven? The answer is you and I, we're going to have transformed bodies when we're in heaven. Now, different religions out there, they have different ideas about the afterlife, right? What they call the afterlife, Platoism, Buddhism, and Hinduism, other Gnostic faiths like those, they teach that the physical body is evil and that after we die, we become pure spirits in what they call the afterlife. And again, there's a lot of Christians out there who've fallen for that whole kind of an idea. They believe that eternity in heaven is you and I being spirits who just lay around on clouds all day. Islam and Mormonism, they teach that people will have physical bodies in heaven and that we'll be married in heaven and that we'll produce children up there in heaven. As a matter of fact, Islam takes it a step further and they say that the most faithful of Islamic men will go to what they call the seventh heaven. That's the top heaven. And when they get there, they're going to be rewarded with 70 virgins. It doesn't sound like much of a heaven for those 70 women, does it? And by the way, those two religions, uh, Islam and Mormonism, they were both started by men who claimed to have met angels of light in a cave who showed them a better way. Remember, Islam didn't come around until 600 years after Jesus conquered death and the grave. And of course, Joseph Smith, he started Mormonism sometime in the 1800s. The Bible it's our prophet now. No one is going to come along and teach a different way. From now until the time Jesus raptures the church, nothing is going to change what it says in the New Testament. And that's why Islam and Mormonism are absolutely false teachings because they're taking the New Testament, throwing it away, and making the claim that they found a better way taught to them by an angel of light. Look what the Bible has to say uh, about angels of light. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15, it says, For such men are false apostles, they're spurious counterfeits, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles, special messengers of Christ, the Messiah. And it is no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. So it is not surprising if his servants also masquerade as ministers of righteousness, but their end will correspond with their deeds. Be careful who you listen to out there. Be careful what you read and what you take into your spirit. It's so much simpler to simply trust God and his word. And God's word tells us that when we get to heaven, we're not just going to be spirits. We're also not going to have these fallen physical bodies. We're going to have transformed bodies, resurrected bodies, just like the Lord Jesus's resurrected body after his resurrection. In the book of First John chapter 3, verse 2, the apostle John says, Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Jesus had a real body after his resurrection. Jesus could eat, he could be touched, and yet he could come and go as he pleased, and neither walls nor distance was an obstacle for him. Jesus had the same body he had before he died. We know that because his friends recognized him, and yet his body was different enough where they didn't always recognize him at first sight. And there's a sub-question that goes along with this question of what kind of bodies will we have after we die. People usually will also ask me, how old will we be in heaven? 
Now, back in the medieval days, Christian philosophers, they used to say that we'll all be about 33 years old when we're resurrected in heaven because that was the age of Jesus when he was resurrected. But I don't think that uh, that's really a fair analysis because God, he doesn't live in time like you and I do. He lives in eternity. And after you and I are resurrected, we're going to live in eternity too. But I can guarantee you this. Nobody's going to be old in heaven, at least not as we describe old now. And that really takes me back. I want to go back to that story about little Colton Burpo, the little boy who had that near-death experience. Remember I told you he told his mom and dad that he met his grandpa up there in heaven. Well, uh, the family, they used to call Grandpa Pop. That was his name. But he died 30 years before little Colton was even born. But Todd Burpo, Pastor Burpo, he decided to get a picture of Pop out and show it to little Colton. And he found this picture he had from when old Pop was about 61 years old, right before he died. And he showed it to little Colton, but there was no recognition. And little Colton looked at his dad real sincere. And he said, Dad, nobody's old in heaven and nobody wears glasses in heaven. And so Todd Burpo, again, Pastor Todd, he called his mom and asked if she could send a picture of Pop from when he was younger, and she did. She sent a picture of him from when he was about in his 30s, and he showed it to little Colton, and little Colton recognized it right away, and he said, uh, yep, that's him. And so what kind of bodies are we going to have in heaven? Well, we're going to have resurrected bodies. We're going to be known as we were known. And question number five What will we do in heaven? The answer is really simple. We're going to be doing in heaven what we're supposed to be doing right here on earth, God's will. Jesus taught us to pray that God's will would be done here on this earth just like it is in heaven. And so in heaven, we're going to still be doing God's will again, just like we should be doing in the here and now. And the bottom line is we're going to spend eternity following the same two simple directives that God gave us to do right here on this earth, loving him above all others and loving others like ourselves. One thing's for sure, heaven's not going to be boring any more than it's boring to be a follower of Jesus right now, do you think being a follower of Jesus is boring? Take a good look around you, man. You are seeing biblical prophecy and revelation fulfilled before your very eyes. You and I, we are the church, the body of Christ. We're part of the biblical narrative right now, and we're still going to be part of the biblical narrative uh, then. And that takes us to question number six. What does heaven look like? Well, that all depends on which heaven you're talking about, the present heaven or the future heaven. The present heaven, again, is that place where the souls and spirits of all the faithful go. And now that's that great cloud of witnesses that we talked about earlier. They're up there in heaven and they're uh, cheering us on. But after Jesus raptures the church and then quells the tribulation and then rules for a thousand years, uh, we're told in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 1, through three. That's where Jesus is talking to the apostle John. Remember, John went up in the spirit and Jesus gave him the revelation. We call it the book of Revelation. It's actually called the revelation of Jesus. Nonetheless, the apostle John in those verses, he says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Everything good that God ever created is going to be in that new heaven, and it's going to be the way it's supposed to be. It'll be the same thing with that new earth. It's going to be the way that God originally intended for it to be before the stain of sin. Now, a lot of people out there, they try to imagine heaven, but they always stop short because they think they can't comprehended. But look what the scripture says to us in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 9 and 10. It says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. 
And so number six, what does heaven look like? Open your Bible and consult the Holy Spirit. And that takes us to the last and the most important question of all. Question number seven, how does a person get to heaven? And that question is actually answered in the most famous verse out of the New Testament, John 3.16. I'm going to put it right here on the screen, and I want you to read it with me, only I want you to insert your own name. I'll insert my own name, and you insert your own name. You ready? For God so loved John Baird that he gave his only begotten son. And since John Baird believes in him, John Baird shall not perish but have eternal life. The truth is, it's easier to get into heaven than it is to get into any professional sports venue in our world today. If you want to go to an NFL game, it's going to cost you $250. The good seats cost thousands, but it doesn't cost anything for you and I to get into heaven. At least it doesn't cost us anything. It costs Jesus plenty. Jesus gave up the riches of heaven and he became lower than the angels so that he could pay the price for you and I to spend eternity with him in heaven. And that's why the thought of heaven should excite every follower of Jesus. Every one of us should be looking forward with everything that's inside of us to getting to heaven one day to be with Jesus. But always remember this, you are already a citizen of the kingdom of heaven because you believe in Jesus. And so the abundant life has started for you right now. But the thought, one of the thoughts that keeps us pressing on is the thought and the wonders of heaven and being with our Savior, our Lord, King, and Savior for eternity. C.S. Lewis said, if you aim at heaven, you'll get earth thrown in. If you aim at earth, you'll get neither. In other words, if you live this life right here with your eyes on heaven, then your life is rich beyond description. But if you live this life here on earth just for this life here on earth, then everything you do means absolutely nothing. It's all for nothing because there is nothing eternal over here on this side of heaven except God's word and souls. And by the way, my favorite thing that Jesus ever said about heaven is found on the last page of the Bible in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 21, verse 5, where Jesus said, Behold, I am making all things new. It's all going to be new and improved, a new and improved earth, a new and improved heaven, and a new and improved you and me. And all you have to do to have it is surrender your life to Jesus. If you haven't done that yet, please, my name and my phone number and my email have been down here at the bottom of the screen the whole time. If you want to talk about surrendering your life to Jesus, please call me, text me, or email me. I'll answer you and we'll reason with one another. If you have already surrendered your life to Jesus, then my prayer for you is that you're going to grow into everything that God created you to be. Until the next time you and I meet here on the Way the Word television program, may God bless you, may God keep you, and may God grant each and every one of you the desires of your hearts, all in Jesus' mighty name. Until then, I'll see you later, everybody.